A very good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me very warmly welcome you to Living Hope Methodist Church. As we gather to worship the Lord this morning, though not in person, but from our homes on online streaming, may God truly help us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Just like to read two verses from Psalm 29, where the psalmist says, Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Shall we just commit this morning's worship before the Lord in prayer? O gracious and loving God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercies upon us through this week. Though there were many things that keeps changing, that affects our daily lives, yet you are an unchanging God. Your love for us, your faithfulness, your mercies, never fail. So we come before you this morning, O God, to honor you, to glorify you, to worship you. So be with us and we pray that through the enabling power of your very own spirit, you will minister to us through our prayers, through our singing, through our giving, through the reading of your word, the preaching of your word. Lord, may your name be glorified and that we would be truly blessed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Together, I, I believe, believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal, Universal Church, Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
A very good morning, church. I want you to be still in the attitude of worship. And uh, I'd like to uh, bring two items for prayer and intercession. Firstly, we want to pray for our own country, Malaysia. As you all know that the COVID-19 situation is uh, serious. Uh, we see the cases have already passing the 3,000 mark. And we know the infectivity rate is also very high. Um, we want to pray and uphold our nation, Malaysia. We we'll pray for also uh, for the uh, Ministry of Health as they give them leadership, give them guidance and wisdom how to ensure that the immunization program is carried out uh, in orderly manner. But we also want to pray for the nation of India. Uh, as you know, that uh, you must have read recently uh, the shortage of oxygen and also the hospitals there are overcrowded overwhelmed with the people uh, and as well as um, the uh, healthcare system is coming to a brink. I pray that uh, you will uphold the nation of India together uh, as I bring these two items to the Lord in prayer. And then we shall end with a prayer that the Lord has taught us to pray, Lord's Prayer. So let us begin to pray and intercede for our nation. As I lead you to pray, wherever you are in your various homes, let us give thanks for God is good. The psalmist says in Psalm 141 verse 2, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So let us pray. Let us commit ourselves to the Lord. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, throughout this past year. Uh, we have suffered as a community of yours in many ways. And sometimes we are crippled with fear. We do not know exactly what to do. Uh, we come uh, with overwhelmed information uh, that has sometimes given us a lot of doubts and, and uncertainties. But Lord, we, in the midst of all these you are still faithful. You are still wonderful. You are still a God that is trusted, a God that is able to do more than we can ever ask. And so, Lord, you are sovereign in this situation even right now. Uh, we know that the situation in our country, especially the pandemic, COVID-19, the cases has been increasing. More so, we see the cases, especially among the young people, between the age from 20 to 29, has been escalating, Lord, really rapidly in the, in the recent days. We want to pray and ask for your intervention, for your divine intervention and help. Because the psalmist says, where does our help come from? Our help comes from you and not in, on anyone else or in anything else. But our help truly comes from you. So help, Lord Jesus, we pray as you, inter, as you intervene. Lord, in our nation, especially we pray for the MOH, the Ministry of Health. Lord, we pray for your wisdom and your guidance upon the leaders, upon these people who are the frontliners, helping, Lord, to cope, cope with the many uh, cases, as well as, Lord, in the, in the rolling out of the immunization. Lord, we pray that this program will come orderly, and we pray that all, that are, all the people who are eligible will be entitled yeah, to have their immunization be carried out, Lord. We want to pray also, Lord, for the nation of India. We know that the situation in India is serious. And we pray, Lord, that you, as a God of mercy, you will continue to intervene in this nation. We pray that the nation's public health system, in fact, already in the verge of collapsing, we ask that they are, you, know, you will enable them, give them wisdom, and we pray for all the nations around to help them, Lord, we ask that the hospitals uh, at the moment are, are really shortest of oxygen. Oxygen. We ask that we, you continue to con pray that you will be able to, Lord, help this nation. And so we ask that you will continue to con uh, enable the leaders of the nation to run the healthcare system systematically, Lord. We pray that India is spiraling into a national crisis at the moment. And because of the hospitals have run out of oxygen, we pray for your mercy 
to stop this exponential infection because a lot of the outbreak of the of health system there, of the uh, outbreak of the highly contagious uh, new variant that is found, Lord, in, in that nation. We ask of your mercy, Lord. We continue to pray for your hands of protection over the nation. We ask, O oh Lord, in this instant for all, both Malaysia and India, your hand of protection upon our nation will continue to be there, Lord, and continue to be there for India too, so that, Lord, in your mercy, Lord, in your mercy, there will be healing. In your mercy, there will be grace, Lord. So, while well, we pray and ask that right, even right now, wherever we are, we'll lift up our voice and cry to you, our God, our Lord, our Savior. And so we thank you for this morning that we can bring these two items to you, as well as, Lord, we want to pray together in unison, wherever we are, the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So that, Lord, we give sacrificially and we give joyfully that may your kingdom come and may your will be done for Living Hope Methodist Church. So we thank you, Lord, for this time of giving. We commit all ourselves to you and all our givings. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. The offering of our gifts and pledges to Living Hope Methodist Church can be done via bank transfer using the account number as stated on this slide. Kindly indicate offering or pledge to treasurer at livinghopemc.com. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Struggles, God in
Good morning, Church, and uh, once again, welcome to our uh, pre-recorded uh, online worship celebration. Uh, and uh, shalom to everyone. Greetings in the name of our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I wish uh, all of you are in good health. I trust that keeping close to the Lord all the time. Uh, I know that this is a last minute change in our uh, Sunday worship celebration. Uh, I want to err on the side of caution and we know that the infectivity rate and the cases are escalating. So in turn, in, to avoid any unnecessary uh, uh, challenges and difficulties, uh, we, we decided, the leadership and I have decided to move on to the uh, pre-recorded worship celebration. And so we'll be doing this for the entire month of May, and uh, we will evaluate this at the end of May and see if we could go back to in-person uh, worship celebration. And so uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and, uh, and today, as we're going to start on a new book of, uh, of our studies, we have completed the book of Colossians, and now we are looking into the book of Deuteronomy. So one book on the New Testament and now the book on Old Testament. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy is an interesting book. Uh, why I say that is because it's the last book of the five Torah books, uh, Pentateuchs, you know, the five books, uh, the Torah, which the Jews recites, and they ensure that these five books are being read every year. Uh, so uh, this is the last book of the five books, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. The name Deuteronomy comes from the Greek words uh, Deuteros. Deuteros means second. And uh, Numos. Numos means the law. And so if you put these two together, you would say the second law. Uh, but I rather want to use the word, it's a repetition of a uh, law, of the same law that was given uh, in Mount Sinai to Moses. Uh, why is a repetition of this law? Because if you remember your history, the biblical history, um, the one generation uh, lost in the wilderness, and now this new generation is coming up to possess the promised land. And so it is a law now given to the new generation because when the law was first given, it was given to the older generation. Now the older generation has passed on, except for two persons, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, as we look into this series, uh, we want to know who is the author. Uh, these, these are the words which Moses spoke to all. That's the first verse of Deuteronomy uh, to all Israel. This is, these are the words. So basically, the Jewish tradition and evidences within the biblical text supports uh, Mosaic authorship, which means Moses is the author of, uh, of this book. And so Deuteronomy is primarily a covenant renewal document. It is a covenant renewal document. It, encourages the people to come back to God, to trust in Him. It prepares the new generation of God's covenant people to live responsibly and joyfully under the Lord's rule in the promised land. Because now the new generation will possess the promised land. So what's the purpose of this book? The purpose of Deuteronomy is distinctly stated as, Hear, O Israel, that's the Shema, which means these are the commands and be careful to do all that I have told you to do. The commands from the Lord. So in the midst of all this widespread polytheism, because there are so many gods, right? As they will conquer one by one, they realize that the people there are practicing many gods. But their God, our God, Yahweh, wants the people of Israel to be distinctively different from the people there. And therefore, he calls them unto himself. And so they are supposed to only worship one God and Yahweh alone. So the book Deuteronomy calls for the renewal of the covenant of the Israelites prepare to enter Canaan, prepare to conquer and occupy the land. And it presents the way of life that they were to follow in the promised land. And so incidentally to this covenant enactment are the curses and would fall on Israel if they fail to observe the stipulations and the blessings they will receive when they obey God. You see, one hand, 
there are curses. One, on the other hand, there are blessings. So if they obey God, they will inherit the blessings of God. But if they disobey God, then the judgment of God will come upon them. So we got the, the name, the author, the purpose. Now, what are the theological values of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is prime source for both, both Old Testament and New Testament theology. Now, if you remember your Bible, the Word of God, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy more than he quoted from any other OT books, Old Testament books. In fact, Jesus quoted three times from Deuteronomy to counter the temptations thrown by the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. God in this book is personal, eternal, all-powerful, sovereign, purposeful, loving, holy, and righteous. There are no other gods that exist. God demands total commitment. Nothing else is acceptable, especially no mingling with other gods or other religious practices as they conquer the, the land, when they enter and occupy the promised land. The people belong to the Lord alone. That is the theological values of the book of Deuteronomy. So you, we will go through this, uh, this preaching series for the next two months or so. And then all that we need to do is when we study this book of Deuteronomy, the back of my, our mind is God is a God that is faithful. A God that is a God that is always good. And so when we obey him, we will really attract his blessings. And the hand of protection of God is always upon us, the people of your, our God. And so let's look at today the first part of the many parts that's going to come uh, in the coming days. Uh, people in transition. I, I would like to uh, share with you this PowerPoint. Yes. A people in transition. That's basically from Deuteronomy chapter 1 and to chapter 3. So as we look into this, I want to all of us to read a few passages that I've, I've taken. First one, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, and then Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. If you have the Bible with you, I hope you all have the Bible with you in hand. Although you are in various, you are in various homes, uh, we need to really open the Word of God because in, there is power in the Word of God. So let's really read together wherever you are. Uh, join me in reading whatever version that you have. Mine is the NIV. And so uh, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. The Lord our God, said to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain, break camp, and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verse 8 again. Verse 8. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. The second passage that I've chosen is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Um, right. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say, the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. 
Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank, thank you for your word that has been kept for us all these centuries. centuries. Lord, we want to pray as we open your word this morning. We pray that your presence will fill us. Holy Spirit, enable us to look deep into your word and bring deep conviction into our hearts. So let us not just study your word, Lord, but let us be a people that is practical and does your word. And, and work out your work, your words in our life. So Lord, we pray that you bless our time together in uh, really studying and going deeper into your word. Lord, I pray that every home will fill with the joy of the Lord, even in this time where fear is so, Lord, coming into every part of corners of our life. But we thank you for you are a good God and a great God. So Father, we pray, keep us alert, I take authority in the name of Jesus, I remove every form of distraction, comes along our way, especially when we look at your word, Lord, this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This book is a series of Moses' passionate sermons. Moses is an old man, and before he dies, He wants to encourage the Israelites to remain faithful and obedient to the Lord. And so Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him. And so we have read the first two passages, and you know that you notice that there are a lot of names. And so I I think this is good. And uh, we thank thank God for this technology that we have. And uh, I believe that as we look into this map, this Deuteronomy map, we begin to understand uh, understand better on the places and how God is leading the people of Israelites. Um, We know that last week, as we heard our brother Archie was sharing to us the Great Sea Crossing, we can see that from Egypt, they came to Sukkoth, and there they crossed the Red Sea, uh, and then they crossed to Mara. And so last week we heard the story. We heard how God took the people of Israel one step at a time. There were 600,000 men, and uh, excluding women and children. So if you add all these people together, there will be about a 1.2, 1.3, maybe about 1.5 million people that were actually going into the promised land. And so we start from Egypt, we slowly move down to Mara, we slowly move down to Elim, as you can see from the map, and you come to Mount Sinai, okay, where uh, it's called Horeb as well. God gives Israel the law through Moses, and this is where uh, the receiving of the law took place in Mount Sinai. Uh, I want to go through with you this, this whole thing so that to give you an overall understanding of how we look at the book of Deuteronomy. Because from here, you see the guiding hands of God through the, on the people of Israel, step by step, all the way. And even sometimes the failure of the people, the falling down of the people of, from disobedience and fear and whatnot, but you see God's hand. God has been faithful. God will continue to watch over his people. And so I want you to understand as we look this map, then you can trace the the cities, the name, it becomes more familiar with you. Keep this map with you all these months that we're going to study uh, the book of Deuteronomy so that it's easy to refer, it's easy to look at. And even when you read the whole book of Deuteronomy yourself, you begin to understand better by looking at this map. And so when they came, after receiving the, the, the commandments, And so Moses, Israel, make the 11-day trek from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. It just takes 11 days to reach Kadesh Barnea. And when at at Kadesh Barnea, okay, if you come to number four, Kadesh Barnea, Israel sends sends spies to scoop out the land. Israel was sending spies to scoop 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 out the land and they returned with news of its goodness 
okay, the spy came back with good news and the giant is giant inhabitants. So Israel rebels against God and refused to enter the land except for two persons, Joshua and Caleb. And so what happened? And then they started to wonder. So from Kadesh Barnea, they were going downward south to, to from going through uh, the place of Arabah Road, they came down to Elath, Elath. And that for 38 years, they were wandering. And then they slowly move up using Moab Road, passing through Moab, Edom, and going up to, to, to the place Anan, Moab, okay, Moab, and move up to Anan. And that's where the battle at Jahaz, taking over the king of his bond, conquering his bond, and moving up to the north at, at the place of uh, the war of Idre, and moving to conquer the king of Bashan. And so you can see from here, and slowly from Bashan, they came to the Mount of Nebo. And that's where uh, Moses went up to the mountain he taught. And God told him to look at the promised land from there. And Moses passed on. He died at the age of 120 years old. And this is slowly, this is actually the overview of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, I'm just giving you in two minutes. Uh, but as we go through this series of the entire book, you will begin to understand how God works powerfully, seriously, wonderfully, and to bring the people into the promised land. And so we go back to the people is in transition. Chapter 1 to 3 summarizes the following. It summarizes that they are now at the age of the promised land. Okay. What was supposed to be an 11-day journey had become 40 years of wandering. Now they are finally preparing to enter the land that had been promised to them. Okay. And so what, what can we learn from this, from chapter 1 to 3? Moses actually picked out, okay, he picked out three things. This is, just summarizes in the following way. Moses actually summarizes the following, in the following way. This is a new generation. As we know that Deuteronomy means second law. It is not a new law, the same law, but was given the second time. And so he picks three episodes from the past. Firstly, he reminds the people of their past and around Mount Sinai. So as you look back to the map, and I mentioned to you, Mount Sinai was a place where God gave Moses the law. And so this was the place that Moses gave the law. And Moses, again, coming back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, he takes three episodes from the past. Uh, why does he pick three episodes from the past? Firstly, he wants to remind the people of their past. Remember their past at Mount, at around Mount Sinai. Why is it so important to remember the past? Because this generation, they do not know the past. And so here, Moses is trying to bring remembrance of God's goodness. They had experienced an awesome encounter with God as he appeared in his power and glory. Because the, this generation didn't go through the, the Red Sea crossing. They didn't go through the power. They didn't experience the power of God. They had received these commandments, been adopted as cho chosen people and given instruction on worship and daily living. You see, Moses is trying to pass on to a new generation. Here you see the heart of Moses is trying to bring the people, the new generation, to an understanding of what God, who is this God they are serving? Who is this God they are now worshipping? And so as, as Moses is trying to bring this memory about the past to the new people, and, they, and God told these people, you need to break camp. Okay, They were told to break camp and advance into the hill country of Amorites. God was telling them to set out the arduous journey towards the promised land. Now, this is the time. Break camp. Sometime in our life, we are told by God, we need to break camp. 
which means we have been sitting on the same thing or, or on the same place or on the same thoughts for a very long, long time. And God is now saying, you need to break camp. And same similarly and to the people of Israel, God is saying, time to break camp, time to move on, time to possess the promised land. And so while the people were excited to break camp and move to the promised land, but the logistics were difficult for Moses alone to bear. And that's why we know that it is not easy for Moses to bear the entire logistic. And so can you imagine the large crowd of, of people, as I mentioned just now, 600,000 men besides the women and the children. And so God directed Moses to appoint other leaders to share the leadership with him. In this whole episode of the past, God, you can see the hand of God, is guiding Moses. And Moses is providing the leadership to the new generation. Secondly, he reminds them of what happened in the wilderness. Verses 19 to 25. Moses reminds them of what had happened in the wilderness. As, you, as we can see that as they were moving in the wilderness, they set off for the promised land and make steady progress. Verse 19 describes how they went through all the vast and dreaded desert. Friends, if God is not there, they will never be able to overcome this. Sometimes in our life, as we look back to the past, God has been there in our life, in every moment of our life. We will not be here where we are without God being there with us in the past. And sometimes, in order for us to be thankful for the people who are grateful, we need to look back for what God has done in our life. We must never be a people of presumptions, a people that always presume that God will provide. God will do this. We must never. We must always remember of his goodness. And so, can you just imagine Moses is also telling them, as soon as they approach the promised land, Moses says to the people, this is the land God is going to give you. So let's take heart and let's go in. You see, Moses bringing back this new generation, telling them as, they, as he relates this into the, into the book of Deuteronomy, it's telling them about what happened in the past. You see, God paved all the way through. They came to Kadesh Barnea. They are ready. Okay? They are ready to enter the promised land. Of course, the group of leaders there suggested that instead, when Moses said, let's go, let's take heart, and let's go in and possess the land. This is the land that God has promised. But then here, yeah, a group of leaders came to Moses and suggested that they should send out some spies to spy out the land. So what happened was they picked 12 men and sent them on their way. Yeah, what happened was the people there became cautious and realized that, oh, we need to go and find out. We need to recce the place uh, just in case. We need to recce the place and find out how to really attack this place. And so Moses really allowed them to go and and check and spy out. So after a while, they came back. These 12 spies came back with great enthusiasm. They said that the country is everything they could hope for. It is a land. It is true what God has said. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. They even brought back some huge bunches of grapes to prove the point. Verse 25. And so... Dear you are, the 12 spies came back with what they saw and tried to bring back to the people there and relate to them. And so they saw the huge bunches of grapes to prove the point that this land, this land is really a town. And so what happened, friends? Thirdly, Moses 
reminds them, although the land was so fertile, they refused to go in. You see, Moses is reminding the new generation, this is, this is what happened. This is what happened. In fact, he's reminding all of us, this is what happened in the past. Firstly, he reminds about the past, how they were at the Mount Sinai. He reminds them of the, what happened in the wilderness. And now he reminds them of their refusal to possess the promised land. Moses was delighted, verses 26 to 46. Moses was delighted with what he hears, but his joy was short-lived. Why? Ten of the spies continue. Yes, the land is great, but there are lots of other people there already, and they are formidable foes. Their cities are well built and well defended. The people who live there are very tall and physically strong. They look, they all look like the incredible hawks. Okay. By comparison, we felt like grasshoppers. We can't possibly overcome these people. There is no way we can capture these cities. The task is hopeless. The people of God are paralyzed by fear. They focus on the problems. They focus on the problems. The size of the population, the number of tribes, the strength of the cities. So often, churches do not move forward. A vision is not realized because we are obsessed with the problems. Friends, I urge you, look at Jesus. I urge you, look at the vision that God has given to us. God will not give us such a vision if he thinks that he will not be able to fulfill it for us. It is not about us, friends. It is about God. It is about Jesus himself. You know what? Fear really crippled the people. Not only the people, but fear can cripple all of us. Fear can be, in a way, freeze all of us from making the next move. It is true. One way always when people will come to intimidate you is to shout at you. The shout of the people who are trying to intimidate you will bring fear into your hearts. And, and that's why across all over the world, when there's any form of, of a rally, they bring in the special branch, the bring in the people who are really fearful, making you fearful. When you look at them, you are already paralyzed with fear. When you hear their voice, you are paralyzed itself. And they will come even open the mouth. So, friends, one way the devil wants to do this is to always bring fear into our life. And so the people then were paralyzed by fear. The people forget, the people forgotten the promises God has made. They forgot what God did for them in Egypt. They forgot how God rescued them at the Red Sea. This was the first generation, okay? They forgot. They forgot how God has met all their needs in the desert. They forgot. Although, they need, although God provided manna, they forgot. All that has gone, all that has God has done in their life has gone out of the window. It has just gone out of the window. In spite of all that has happened in the past, they do not believe God can help them now. How sad. How sad is our God. How sad is when Moses heard that. How sad is he. The reason they did not enter the promised land was not because of their sinfulness. It was not that. It was not because they were weak and inadequately equipped. It was not that too. It was not because they had been guilty of idolatry or immorality. No, it was not. It was because they did not believe that God could do what he promised to do. 
It was not because of their sinfulness, but because of their faithlessness. Friends, no faith means you are shortchanging what God wants you to have. They did not trust what God had said. Simply that it's nothing to do with all that they have seen. They simply did not trust God. And so far from trusting God, they start criticizing him. Can you just imagine? When God told you to tell you to do something, instead of you obeying him, and yet you go around criticizing him. And that's what they did. The first generation said, God hates us. That's the reason why he has put us in this impossible situation. But Moses says, no, he doesn't. He loves you. He is the Lord your God. He will be there right with you, just as he was in Egypt. But the people would not listen, friend. See, verse 32 puts it this way. Verse 32, chapter 1, verse 32, put it this way. You did not trust in the Lord your God. And so the people refused. The people refused to listen. The people refused to listen to Moses, their spiritual leader. They decide not to go into the land. And they are condemned. And can you just imagine for the next 40 years, in fact, the next 38 years, they were wandering around the wilderness. This generation will die. The next generation will enter the land. So a journey of 10 days, about 11 days almost, took 40 years. Then as soon as God, as you say, may not go into the land, you know what happened? They decided they will. When God said, don't go, since you don't want to go, you will be wondering what generation will be lost. And But then they decide to go. And God says, if you go up, you will be defeated. But they still march up into the hill country. And the Amorite army, what happened? They came down like a swarm of bees, verse 44, and chased them out of the country. And so Moses did this. Moses wrote it on the debacle wars in verse 43. Moses said this, you rebelled against the Lord's command. Why you do that? Friends, sometimes in our life, it's the same thing. You see, when God asks us to do something, we refuse to do because we are so afraid of what we see coming or what we see there in our eyes. But then after a while, we realize that God has told us, no, this is a promise. And we decide to go in spite of the fact that God says, don't do it now. You see, there is always a window of opportunity. That's why we always call it a window. There is a window. Even biblically, there is always a window. That's why we always say the window of heaven is upon us. And this is a time that we need to rise up. But friends, sometimes the window closes in. And when the window closes, nothing else we can do to penetrate through. Because the window has closed. And so, here yeah, we learn. Why does Moses spend so much of time reminding the people of what happened and the way they failed? You see, he does not do so because he wants to embarrass them. Moses doesn't want to embarrass them, but because he wants them to learn from their mistakes. Friends, we need to learn. We need to learn from the mistakes that the first generation of the people of Israel those who do not learn from their mistakes are doomed to, to repeat them. And that's why we need to learn. We need to learn. What are the applications of all these, these three episodes that was picked by Moses in chapter 1 and even to the entire chapter 3? What are the applications? How does this all apply to us? We all need challenges from time to time. And we often panic and feel we cannot cope. You see, we all panic. We all make mistakes and sometimes forget to learn and face new challenges. 
So we go on repeating the same mistakes. What is the antidote? What is the antidote to fear? How can we overcome fear? Firstly, we need to remember what God has done in the past. Let's be grateful. Let's be thankful. Like the people of Israel, we easily forget how God has helped us and answered our prayers in the last. You see, sometimes we are always forgetful people. When we are in good time, we forget about the past, how God has done. And so this is what Moses is trying to point out to them in verses 30 to 31. Don't you remember how God defeated the Egyptians? Friends, don't you remember what God has done to you 20 years ago in your life? Don't you remember what God has done to you even two days ago? Or even the past one week? Don't you remember how God carried your fathers through the desert like a father carries his child? And that's what exactly what God did to the people of Israel, the first generation who came out of Egypt. One of the great antidotes to fear is thinking back and remembering what God has done. I'm always grateful what God has done in my past life, in the life where I used to come from. And God is so gracious. We don't deserve it, and yet he has done. And he has taught us great things and values. And as we look back, we only can count our blessings. Count our blessings one by one. Friends, it's good to write down our blessings, what God has done. Sometimes as you learn how to write it down, you begin to understand this, that this God is a God that has done great and mighty works in our life. And so one antidote to fear is to look back and see what God has done. We need to remember that God forgives us. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. And so Christ set us free for freedom. Why? Because if we cannot remember God forgives us, we will then always go back to the point where we feel guilty of our life, where we feel guilty of what we have done, where we feel guilty and we feel hindered from moving on, from breaking camp. We feel hindered and we feel fearful that harm will come into our path. God does not abandon any one of us. In fact, he doesn't abandon anyone. He does not abandon the people of Israel in spite of the fact that they have been ranging and disobeying him all of his while. The story of the Old Testament is a story of God's constant love for his people in spite of everything. In spite of everything, God forgives them and presses on with them, and He will do the same with us. God forgives. Remember, you have the, the Son has set you free, and you are free indeed. That no clutches of guilt of the past, of whatever thoughts that comes to your mind, it doesn't hold you. Because Jesus has died for you and he has set you free. So not only that you remember what God has done for you in the past, you also remember that God forgives you and has set you free. Finally, you need to remember God's promises, the hope. In verse 8, Moses reminds them of God's promise. God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants to give them a land. And even though now there has some delay, he is about to give them the land he promised. We too, like them, can trust the promises of God in spite of our failings. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of age. 
I saw friends, three applications, three antidotes to overcome fear. One, be grateful to God. Be thankful for what God has done to us. Number two, be free. Free from the clutches of guilt. Be free from every form of intimidation that people have thrown at you. Be free from whatever past sins that always haunting you. Be free because Jesus has set you free. When the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Third, remember God's promise. As a church, I want you to remember what God has promised us. As an individual, I want you to remember what God has promised you and your family. What God has promised you, he will keep to his promise. And that's why it is called covenant. A covenant, it is not a contract. It is not an agreement, but it is a covenant. When God covenant with you, he keeps his covenant, even though sometimes you don't keep your part of of the covenant, but God is faithful. And so friend, we need to remember fear is real in our life. Fear is real in the life of the Israelites. As they saw the giants, they became so fearful. They forgot that God is almighty and that he is mighty to deliver, mighty to save. They forgot that God is the one that is fighting the battle. The battle does not belong to them, to the people, but the battle belongs to the Lord. The Lord fights for them. For them. They forgot. But here we are. We have hope. We have hope and we trust God. And so, friend, as we look into this, I also want to you to know that we have a God that is a God that is kind and good. I want to uh, end with this story. <coughs> David Watson, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, know David Watson. David Watson was a clergy, was a pastor of an Anglican church. And David Watson was, a, was a, actually an Anglican church leader and an author. He authors a lot of books. But this book, Fear No Evil, is the last book that he wrote just a few weeks before he died. He struggled from cancer. Fear No Evil is the personal account of his losing battle with cancer. What happened was in January 1984, he actually died in, in, in 1984. He flew to California to his friend, John Weber's Vineyard Church for an intense time of prayer and healing, for healing. And he did all he could to find healing, and a lot of people prayed for him. Uh, experienced teams prayed with him for two to five hours a day, over eight days. And yet, everything got worse. Everything got worse. And so I want to read to you the last words that David Watson wrote as he finished this book, his last book, We Are No Evil. Quote, the asthma persisted so that I slept badly each night. My legs, ankles, and feet blew up like balloons. And my abdomen grew at an astonishing rate until I looked like a pregnant woman. My arms and shoulders withered into mere skin and bones. I looked more dead than alive. However, God has been far from inactive in my life. At about 1 a.m., I had a bad asthma attack. In my helplessness, I cried out to God to speak to me. I'm not very good at listening to God, but between 1 and 3 a.m., God spoke to me so powerfully and painfully that I have never felt so broken before him. He showed me that all my preaching, writing, and other ministry was absolutely nothing. 
compared to my love relationship with him. God also showed me that my love for him meant nothing unless I was truly able to love from my heart my brother or sister in Christ. As the Lord put various names into my mind, I began to write letters to about 12 people asking for forgiveness for hurting them. It was the most painful pruning and purging I can remember in my entire Christian life. Whatever else is happening to me physically, God is working deeply in my life. His challenge to me can be summed up in three words. Seek my face. I am now. I'm not now clinging to my physical life. Although I still believe that God can heal and wants to heal. But I'm clinging on to the Lord. I'm ready to go and be with Christ forever. That would be literally heaven. But I'm equally ready to stay if that is what God wants. Father, not my will, but yours be done. In that position of security, I have experienced once again this perfect love, a love that casts out all fear. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the history of your people, especially the Israelites who came out of Egypt and wanting to go to the promised land, but they failed because they did not trust you, Lord. Lord, forgive us in times when we are also untrust, not trustworthy, in times where we are faithless because we are afraid. Fear is real, Lord, in our life. And even Jesus felt the fear. And that's why he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that he said to you with blood and sweat mingling on his head, forehead, because he's so fearful, he says, Lord, if you can take the cup away from him. But then he submitted your will to your will, to your perfect will, not his fear, but to your will. Lord, grant us faith. Grant us as a church faith to trust you, Lord, faith to believe in you, faith to remember the past, remember the vision that you have given to us as a church to go in to possess the promised land. Lord, you have called all of us individually to fulfill the destiny that you have given to our lives, to our families, to our children. Lord, let us not be fearful, but to trust you, Lord. Let us count our blessings one by one. Let us remember and be thankful. Let us know that we are forgiven. If you have set us free, we are free indeed. And let us know the eternal hope that we all have because we have come to know you. Lord, bring us back to the point where we know that it is ours and ours alone. And help us, Lord, to lay hold of the inheritance, the eternal inheritance that you have given to each and every one of us. Let us lay hold of them and let us not throw that out of the window, but to trust and obey fully because there's no other way but to trust and obey. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus, Savior, Lord, Lord, to thee I 
Church, we have come to the end of our worship celebration. Uh, I, I want to bring to you the close and uh, give you the benediction. Let us remember one more thing is do, do not fear. Let us keep in tandem and walk with faith, not by our sight. Come, let us pray. Lord, I just come before you this morning and afternoon. Lord, impart to your people faith. We receive your faith, the power of your anointing on our life. We receive, Lord, boldness and courage as we walk the journey of our life. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of us represented in our homes, our families. Lord, may you impart to us your blessings, your protection, and your favor. We thank you for this morning, this afternoon, for your word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and give you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week, church. God bless. Oh.